Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. Hello everybody, I'm very happy to be invited by my colleagues uh, to give this talk. Um, this is about uh, the Levant, uh, about uh, some Ashleyan sites in Israel, and in particular I would like to speak today about the Ashleyan site uh, of Gesher Bnot Yaakov, and in particularly about the human behavior uh, that is coming through the analysis of the finds of this site. Uh, well, the producers of the Achillean uh, are considered to be Homo erectus, and uh, although they emerged uh, at about two million years ago, uh, and they are found in association with the African assemblages, Achillean assemblages, uh, in Israel, we have a, a record also of the Ashalian and quite an early one, although not as early as in the African one. Uh, when we speak about the Ashalian and the distribution of the Ashalian sites, we see that for the first time, it is due to the Homo erectus uh, to go out of the continental border of uh, Africa and into dispersing into the old world. Um, the sites in Africa are located or associated with the African Great uh, Rift Valley that you can see it over here. This uh, Rift Valley continues and continues uh, here to the Levantine Corridor and the sites that we are having uh, in Israel are located in this trough, in this uh, rift, which is part, a component of the African Great Rift Valley. Uh, within our part of the African, of the African record, if you may, or with, uh, of the early Ashalian, we have the sites uh, uh, here, two sites, two Ashalian sites, one is uh, Ubadia and is uh, quite ancient, it's about one 1.6, uh, 1.5 million years old, and I will not talk about it today. My talk today is dedicated to the site of GBY, Gesher Bnot Yaakov. Uh, so uh, the route, the, the exact uh, the route is not known, of course, but we assume that it was like that because of the conditions that and, and the Palo climate and the Palo environment, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. So people came from Africa, but the rate of uh, diffusion is not known. And you will see when I will continue my talk that it's not that the people are, as depicted in this uh, cartoon, it's not that they are packed and are going, uh, going out uh, from one point to the other, you will see that they have to adjust to the new environments. They have to adjust to the new ecology. They have to adjust to the new um, climate. They have to adjust to everything because when you compare the um, Levantine corridor to the African environment, uh, these are two, two totally different uh, kingdoms in the flora and also very different in terms of the fauna. 
So the site of GBY uh, is known now for the last 75 years. Uh, the first excavator, or the one of the two first excavator, um, found out uh, elephant tusks and a, a number of bifacial tools. And he, Professor Steckelis, uh, the founder of uh, my department, uh, he looked at the tools and he said, okay, this is very similar to the tools that one finds in Africa because for the first time in Israel, uh, and that was actually, you know, uh, earlier than Israel, it was during the British mandate times of the country, uh, he found uh, artifacts that were made on basalt and basalt was not known in Israel. These were also cleavers. And he understood that cleavers are coming from Africa because he was very well acquainted with the literature of what was coming out of the excavations of Louis and Mary Leakey. They were uh, colleagues, they vi visited each other and they had a lot of knowledge. So what you see here, actually in the photograph, is that you see here that this is the Jordan River. We'll see uh, in a minute uh, better maps. And he dug pits, very deep pits, and there was a lot of problem because at the bottom of the pits, and not only in the bottom, he was in wet conditions, in, in water conditions. And you can see that it's all muddy here, and you can see here they're trying to get out the, the uh, um, elephant task and I think the photograph was done between 1935 and 1954 somewhere. So um, let us talk a little bit about the the area. Um, the red dot over here is where the site is and this is the the Dead Sea Rift. And you can see that it's uh, pretty narrow. I mean, I didn't put a scale of here, but it's uh, several kilometers, 30, 40 kilometers at times. You have the Dead Sea, which is the deepest place on Earth. Oops. Deepest place on Earth. Very, maybe I should do it like this. Uh, so this is the Dead Sea. Uh, today it's about minus 425 meters, I think, below sea level. Then you have the Sea of Galilee over here, which is um, minus 200 meters. And then you have here, what existed here was a lake, the Hula Lake, the northernmost uh, lake in the series. This is terribly salty. This is uh, fresh water, but the Hula was very, very... Um, sweet water and it was drained in 1945. Now the point, the red point, uh, depicts the location of the site at the southernmost part of the, the Hula, ancient Hula Lake. Because the modern Hula Lake, the one that was drained in 1954, um, uh, is located in the same location of, of uh, the old uh, lake. This we know because of a long series of uh, drillings that took place uh, over there. And also we know from different geological studies that the depth of the Hula Valley of this part over here, the depth of it underground is about nine kilometers. So you have to think of a series of very deep holes in going from the very salty lakes to the central Jordan Valley and the upper Jordan Valley. And uh, this is where it's the sweetest and uh, probably the shallowest uh, lake that existed. Now what is ca causing all these series of lakes is the fact that when you see uh, the landform, which is east, the, the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River is flowing here and everything east to it is actually on the uh, Arabian plate. 
and everything west to the east, to here, to the Jordan Valley, is another plate. Uh, it's, it's the Egyptian plate or the Sinan plate. And the two plates are moving one against the other. This is moving faster than this part. And as a result, you can see it here. This is the, the, the location of the Hula Valley is over here. This is the two bridges that you can see on the map, one bridge over here and one bridge over there. The old excavations are here and my excavations are over here. Uh, and what you can see is actually the two plates, this plates against these plates. And the fact that they are moving against each other is causing a lot of tectonic disturbances. Uh, this is a, a strike slip uh, a fault and uh, a lot of tectonic and uh, old tectonic and new tectonic uh, disturbances, which are making the archeologists life miserable. Okay, so on the left hand side, you can see the stretch, the chronological stretch or duration of the Ashelian in Israel. We are now going to talk about a million or a 0 0.79, uh, this is the date for the site. Uh, so we have earlier sites and we have many more later sites. The map that you can see over here shows you some of the excavated areas of the Ashalian, excavated sites, excuse me. Uh, basically, we have over 360 find spots of Ashalian surface finds, but quite a few number of, um, of excavations. And again, our site is over here. Because of these uh, uh, extensive tectonic movements that I have mentioned, you can see that we never had in a normal excavation, if I may say so, but what we had is all the archaeological uh, subsites, all the archaeological horizons that we excavated at the GBY site, all of them are actually tilted. And this is a picture that shows you two things. A, that this is the last year of the excavations. We had only seven seasons from 1989 to 1997, seven seasons of excavations. But we, uh, along the river, we had to, to survey. And you can see my team here, the geologist and my first hand assistant over here in a boat. None of the Israelis are really good boaters. And you can see a lump of clay over here. And this lump of clay is actually one of the exposures of the formation, the Gesher Bnot Yaakov formation, in which the, the site is bedded. So this is an, an early uh, and the middle Pleistocene formation with a lot of Ashalian uh, occurrences in this. So, the geological work, because of all this tectonism, the geological work was very difficult because we had to tie it up from very, very small exposures and come up with some general understanding of the site. And what you can see also in this picture is you can see a pipe over here. The site was, uh, is waterlogged and on one hand, we had to pipe the water out of the site all the time with the mud pumps. On the other hand, we had to spray water all the time in order to conserve the, the, the finds. And this is, of course, quite a complicated uh, um, situation. On the surface, we saw absolutely nothing. Excuse me. So, uh, with the help of the geologist, and I would like to mention the fact that we could not have had any success in our studies if we would not have worked with geologists. The, the geological work, particularly in the first stage, the, the structural geology was a necessity in order to understand what we are looking at. 
So we had to quarry several trenches and we tried to do a minimal uh, damage on the environment. A, a very narrow trench, um, a little bit uh, over one meter, and these trenches were dug um, uh, perpendicularly to the strike of the layers. So those of you who are not very familiar with the geological terms, the trenches were done in such a way that allowed us to have a realistic view of the thickness of the layers which were exposed in the trenches. And once the trenches that you can see over here, trench three, trench two, trench six, trench one, trench five, once the trenches were these uh, were exposed, then we started to open the surfaces of the excavations, uh, uh, which were going along the strike and the deep, always tilted, yeah, along the strike uh, and the deep. And actually this trench was aimed uh, in order to catch the, the flow of water uh, underground water that came from higher topography over here. And as you can see, this is the River Jordan. In order to uh, have a very uh, methodological, uh, precise excavation, we had to put a grid system, a one square grid system that uh, with plumb lines that touched the slopey surfaces that we excavated. So uh, methodologically, it was quite uh, difficult. First of all, it was difficult to, to put this grid system on the open air. It's not on, a, and I didn't have any no, uh, modern machinery like total station and, and things like this. So we had to do it very meticulously on the field. And then we also had a, so we had a grid system, a permanent grid system laid out uh, on, on the air. And above it, we had a screen because the, the sun is uh, hot uh, in, in the valley. <clears throat> Maybe not hot for you people coming from Southeast Asia, Asia <laughs> and South Asia, but uh, for us, uh, it can reach uh, the 40s uh, in the summer and the summer was the season when we carried out our excavations. So the, the river is flowing south, but mind you, when we uh, reconstructed the environment during the deposition of the sites, um, there was no river there and everything was drained, not like today to the south, but everything was drained to the north and we actually are situated on the, the very southern part of the old lake, uh, the old Hula Lake. So in order to understand what is going in all these uh, trenches, uh, first of all, I would like to show you the trenches and to uh, please pay attention to the depth. We were able to analyze about 34 meters thick of the formation, of the Bnotiakov formation. And what the different trenches that you saw there in the previous slide is, are showing you here is that at the top of the sequence and at the bottom of the sequence, we have two conglomerates, two river systems that are flowing probably north and not uh, as currently south. And in between all the layers that you see here is actually a, 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 a deposition of lake and, and the lake edge environment. Sometimes you have sands when the lake retreats and other times you have either um, two types of uh, silty clay uh, uh, sediments, which are a result of the position in the water of the lake. So we have different um, movements of the lake. It's not annual. Uh, because uh, we know now that the total depth, uh, the 34 meters um, actually represent about 100,000 years of duration. 
So this is not an annual movement, but uh, at least it shows us by the, the, the coquina, by the mollusks, by the sand, by the gravels, by the mud, the history of the, this ancient lake at the southern edge of this lake. <coughs> now, sorry, uh, you see the little red triangles, these little red triangles mark the position of archaeological horizons. We have in these trenches more than 22 individual archaeological Achillean horizons. Some of them are with very poor findings and some of them are with thousands and thousands of finds. Um, so we can say that from the bottom, from the top of the sequence of this archive to the bottom of the archive, we all along we have a, a presence of hominins in this uh, part of the, the Jordan uh, Valley, in the northern part of the Jordan Valley. And in order to get a better understanding of, of the sequence, we, we and, and simplify the, the record of the six trenches, um, we have uh, produced this composite section which shows you this is the top of the section with the conglomerates, the bottom of the section with the conglomerates. You see the, the red triangles, you see animal bones depicted here, you see a lot of mollusks all, all around, and you see something else which is pieces of wood, which is actually much more common than what you see here. Uh, in terms of uh, chronology, we were able to find over here the change, uh, the, the paleomagnetic change, the Bruns Matuyama uh, crown, um, which is dated globally at 0 0.78 and uh, some, by some others 0 0.79. So at least we know that at this line over here in the deposit, it, a, this is the exact date of the of the site, and um, the geologist and the sedimentologist who was working with us was able to connect or suggest this curve of the uh, MIS curve, uh, marine isotope uh, stages curve, and as you can see here, we go from twenty point two to 18.2, and this was verified later by another uh, uh, penetration into the formation by two drillings, one drilling over here of GBY2. This is done about uh, 200 meters north of the excavation, and again uh, by another drilling, this was going uh, deep into about 50 meters inside the sediments and this one was going 122 meters deep inside the sediments and it, it, this one showed us in both places we got the Bruns Matuyama uh, so we have a, now a nice uh, um, cover of this area in terms of the change in the paleomagnetic record but here uh, below the some 20 odd meters of sediments, we penetrated into 80 meters of basalt flows. And the top of the, more or less the top of the basalt flows yielded an age, a given age of about 1.1 or 1.3 million years. So in other words, we can say now that the entire archive that is depicted here, which we uh, exposed in the excavations is lying over uh, tilted basalt flows which are the, the top is dated to uh, 1.1 million years ago. And this uh, is in accord with uh, some other uh, um, geographic correlations with the middle part of the of the Jordan Valley, but I will not uh, speak about that uh, here. Now you see that over here we have uh, indicated that there are lots of uh, indexes and cleavers. 
by faces. But I said that the entire system, the entire archive has a, a, a chalene in it. So at the bottom, in, inside this conglomerate, we did not find um, handexes or cleavers, but we did find the products of making handexes and cleavers, not in situ. This is not in situ and the top is not in situ. And everything that we have excavated uh, down here, all along the sequence, uh, seems to have uh, been left in place without any major movement because of the very shallow lake and the very um, undistinguished wave action in this part of the lake. Okay, so here we have uh, Achillean handexes and, and uh, cleavers not in situ. Here we have the products of making uh, flint Achillean uh, handexes and so the entire sequence is um, Achillean. I said before that the entire sequence stretched about uh, 100,000 years, but we specified that between this, between the top and this area over here, we uh, have about 50,000 years. I would like to tie this with, the, with the, a, a phrase that I said in the beginning of the presentation, where I, I referred to the movement. It's, I, I would like to stress this point because I think people um, uh, seem to ignore it and they always speak how fast Homo erectus spread all the way from East Africa all the way down to Java. Uh, it's not that uh, they are on the trails all the time. Uh, it's not that they are, they are in the environment and the fact that we have here uh, about 50,000 years of extensive uh, occupation at this uh, uh, southern edge of the lake is very meaningful in terms of our understanding of how hominin behaved in the landscape and uh, we have uh, the other side uh, the other side I mentioned uh, Ubadia, which is much older, 1.6 million years. Also in Ubadia, we have a very long sequence of occupation. And that should be taken into consideration when we speak about diffusion and particularly when we speak about um, uh, adoption uh, to a new environment or living and understanding uh, uh, the area. Okay, and the site is really a waterlogged one. Excuse me, it's not Corona, but uh, it's a waterlogged one. And I would like to show you these two pictures of the same object. This is a wood, a piece of wood. It's an artifact. It's a polished piece of wood, we published it many years ago. It's a, it's a piece of a willow tree. Uh, it's broken in both ends, at both ends, so we don't know what was the function of it, but the fact that the site is waterlogged actually gave us a fantastic opportunity to understand and reconstruct the environment in which people were living in. So what are the ways uh, to uh, what are the ways to learn about the hominin abilities and behavior and culture at the Achillean site? Uh, first of all, it's subsistence, because if we don't understand how they manage in that environment, we will be uh, without any information. So our understanding is coming through of the subsistence and particularly of the diet is coming from the flora and is coming from the fauna. And of course, coming from the material culture. Um, in this presentation, I would like first to discuss the subsistence and only then the material culture. And I would like in this presentation to speak very, very briefly about the flora and the fauna 
and uh, because many of you are archaeologists, perhaps speak a little bit more about the material culture and give you an insight into the issues and the problems that, uh, that uh, we are having. So um, I, I hope you see the, the full screen because I don't see it. Uh, the heading here is paleontology. And this is, uh, on the left-hand side, is the most complete elephant skull that was found in the Near East, at least in the Pleistocene. Uh, you can see that uh, it's in a very good uh, shape, as many of the bones are. And uh, only the, the, the occipital part of the skull is missing because of the human activity but I will not go into the details here. Uh, what we found are a, a lot of mollusks. Mollusks, they were not eaten, they were not consumed, mollusks that are a part of the environment of the, this uh, particular uh, sweet water, uh, freshwater lake uh, uh, environment. So you see that they are, a, a, it's very rich and we have uh, 19 families, 34 uh, genera and over 70 species. And there's a lot of ground to be studied here. It was only touched very lightly. And I hope that sometime in the future, a student would be interested in the work. Then we have 22 species of ostracods and that we can compare them to the recent lake, to the old lake and to the site. Then we have a very interesting um, collection of 13 species of fish. But from this uh, species, the hominins consumed mainly uh, purposefully, they looked for uh, the carps. And these carps are very big. They are over one meter long and some of them over two meters long and they ate a lot of it, uh, which is a, a very interesting in, in respect to the diets. We have 19 species of birds, um, and these birds are mainly water birds. Then we have 12 species of micro mammals. We have six species of amphibians. Some of them are still living uh, today in the Hula Valley. We have four species of reptiles. Some of them are still living in the Hula Valley. And we have 19 medium to large mammals. And uh, this is uh, very interesting because uh, it goes from the size of the elephant to uh, the size of, uh, of a, a gazelle and uh, with lots of cervids. And remember where we are, we are actually on the route between Asia, Europe and Africa. So we have a, a composition of some African elements, uh, but also many elements which are non-African. And uh, this is of course, the, the corridors are not uh, uh, restricted only to hominin movement, of course, but corridors are uh, highways for, uh, for vegetation and for flora and for fauna. Okay, this is a, a strange uh, photograph. You can see two of my uh, colleagues, both are now uh, um, prehistorians of, of uh, reputation and Gonen Sharon and Edith Saragusti, and they are excavating a hole. This is area C. This is a, a very, very small scale excavation. All the GBY is very small excavation. You can see the Jordan River over here, and here we have a, a banquet of about the less, sometimes less than a meter. Uh, separating the site, the tilted floors of the site from, from the recent Jordan. The, the point in this uh, um, illustration is to show you in, in this little space that you see between this bucket and, and this water container, all the animals that you can see here were represented individually. 
In other words, you have representation of two elephants. It's not that uh, we have all the remains of the elephants in here, but we have definitely uh, um, two individuals in this area. You see the hippo, you see the horses. We have two types of horses in here. You see the goat, you see the, uh, all the different types of servants over here. You see the, the boar and uh, different types of servants over here and a, a single tooth, tooth of a bear and so on and so forth. So um, before um, opening this area, we had no idea what we are going to find as in every single archeological site. And I think this is part of the charm of archeology span that you, are, you don't know what you're going to find. But the fact that such a concentration was existing here, and it's not only the concentration, but the fact that most of the bones that were recovered here had a very clear impact of the hominins. And then most of the bones were cracked. There wasn't a single complete bone. They were cracked in order to, to extract the marrow from the bones. And um, there are all kinds of uh, damage markings on the bone. So this in, um, I am working on the site only, um, I think 35 years, uh, but this uh, became a, just recently a, a very hot topic from our perspective because we had to explain how come that such an agglomeration of, um, of um, animals that were a component of the diet uh, were uh, damaged and of course exploited in such a small surface. And uh, I will touch upon this uh, later. Now, in the uh, right hand side of, the, of this um, slide, uh, uh, there's a hunter's choice. I'm summarizing here what we learned. We learned that the people had um, um, preferences. They liked uh, elephants, they liked uh, fallow deer, and they liked uh, a hippo. In each of the, nearly each of the horizons in GBY, we found these uh, three elements, which means that they actually, you know, knew the behavior and were capable of hunting and processing the carcasses of uh, from very large animals to smaller animals, but they had a preference what to kill. Then they knew how to handle the carcasses. They knew how to handle the butchery. We see this because we have a lot of uh, cut marks on the pieces of the bones. And then the technological and cognitive abilities, we learned about this because we compared the way in which fallow deers were um, processed um, based on the cut marks in the upper Paleolithic times by modern humans. And we compared it to what we found. And we found out that this uh, GBY hominins had full understanding of the anatomy of, of, the, of the carcass, just similarly to that of the modern humans. And then uh, we have learned a lot about the diet uh, that uh, came out from the analysis of the fauna. And uh, from the fauna, I'm moving to the, to the flora. Um, on the excavations, we found a lot of uh, wood pieces. Uh, you see here, uh, Edith is, is handling a piece of oak, which is about uh, a meter, I would say a meter, and maybe a meter and a half. And it's, it's not fossil, it's, it's very soft. You can actually cut it. Uh, the picture on the right-hand side shows you how the section, I, I cut it with a Japanese knife, how the section of the oak looks like. We had to cut, a, not this branch, another one that was lying under the elephant skull, 
because uh, we don't we didn't want, want to to damage the the branch uh, th this uh, log uh, so we cut it um, and you see the section and you can see a, a very amazing picture of the annual rings of the oak which which is uh, actually a mirror of what happens nowadays. You have very, very lush years with lots of annual precipitation, and then you have drought years with very little ones. So uh, we could not tie it to any um, dendrochronology or anything like this, uh, of course, but uh, nevertheless, we could, we could manage uh, to see that the climate was not a, you know, a very stable thing, but uh, but uh, it changed from year to year. There was a, a glimpse into the 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 the, the early um, middle place, uh, the, the the early part of the middle Pleistocene at the Hula Valley. Now, from the remains, we had several thousands of remains. We collected pieces from two centimeters on. And we came to know that I think there were about 26 species of trees, which gave us a picture of a Mediterranean typical arbo arboreal uh, flora. Uh, and there was only one single species that could not identify uh, within the current day uh, flora Palestina. And the reason is, that it's probably a relict, a relict from Pliocene times that, uh, that became uh, extinct and we have no trace. But it appears in every single, um, every single uh, layer that we excavated. So it seems that it was dominant and not dominant, but it, it, at least it was a, a very current uh, type of um, of tree in the environment. Uh, we also, uh, due to the fact that we identified uh, um, different um, types of uh, vegetation, uh, that was the uh, trees, uh, uh, bushes, uh, uh, and uh, climbers, uh, we solved several uh, big discussions about when particular species uh, floral species emerged in the Mediterranean uh, zone in our part of the Eastern Mediterranean. And it turns out that lots of the things that we are very familiar already existed in the early middle uh, Pleistocene times. I say early middle because the richest layers are from the early middle uh, Pleistocene. We do have lots of layers from the lower Pleistocene, but they are meager in terms of finds. Okay, now that uh, we were over with the analysis of the wood fragments and also a, a long study of their taphonomy, we were wet sieving every single bucket that came out of the excavation. Uh, in the Jordan, it was very easy and uh, efficient in a way to do it. And what came out uh, from the sieve, the wet sieving was, <coughs> excuse me, a hundred thousand plant remains. And as you can imagine, uh, sorting through the 100,000 plant remains took quite a long time. At the end, after over 20 years of sorting, we can say that over 20,000 pieces were seeds and fruits. And um, we were able to identify over 20,000 pieces to the species or a genus level, which was very nice. And uh, of course, we had some a portion that was unidentifiable. I hope that all of you are um, familiar with the picture on the left-hand side, which shows you uh, the Makana. And you will be surprised to learn um, that we found in this lake, in these sediments, in this 
Um, um, actually, Makana appears uh, in the sequence from the early Pleistocene to the early, uh, from the early Pleistocene to the early middle Pleistocene. We have Makana growing in this lake, and that's the only uh, place uh, in the Near East where we have identified it. And I will uh, speak a, a little bit more about the Makana later on in the lecture. And of all the remains, over 9,000 pieces were of edible species. So for the first time in the Paleolithic record, at least of the lower Paleolithic and to some extent also the middle Paleolithic, we can understand what these people actually ate from the floral uh, world, from the edible plants. So they ate nuts. We have a species producing a, a underground storage organs. Uh, we, we did not find the um, tissues of the underground storage organs because these are very uh, porous and they don't conserve well, but we found the other uh, products of the plants. We have fruits, we have seeds, and we have vegetable producing species. The, on the left hand side, you can see uh, a current day picture of the, of the Hula Valley with the nature reserve, uh, which is the same, actually depicting the same conditions as the early ones. Um, and until the 19, 54, when the recent Hula Lake was drained, there was a survey of the flora. And in this little part of the world, there were 300 special species of edible uh, plants. And of these uh, 300, of course, we lost a lot, but in the old times, we were uh, capable of identifying five, 55 species of edible plants and it gives us, you know, a long array of, of um, diversity in terms of seasons, in terms of, of uh, species, in terms of production. Some of the plants produce more than a single uh, source, uh, uh, more than a single edible source. And so we have enriched uh, uh, our knowledge. Um, and I think the last uh, slide about the flora is, um, is a graph that shows you the four seasons. And it shows you at the bottom, it shows you different layers of the sequence. And uh, these are the youngest and these are is the oldest. And you can see, and here you have the number of, uh, of uh, um, species found, and you can see something very interesting, that in each of the seasons, uh, in each of the layers, the four seasons are represented, which means something about this uh, environment that the people lived in, that it was, uh, in a way, so lush that it actually produced uh, edible plant material throughout the, the year. And I can say the same thing about the uh, animals, about the, the fauna, which I've shown you earlier. And you could see that the diff these different species are, are, most of them territorialists and they live in the same area. So they were uh, uh, available uh, year round also as, as the flora did. And now I will show two, uh, well, show first a summary of, uh, of the paleobotany. And by the way, uh, on the left-hand side is a picture of uh, Trapanatans, which are, oh, what's the name in English? Water nuts. Water nuts? I can't hear you, but it's okay. Uh, if water chestnut. Water, water chestnut. Water chestnut. Yeah, I forgot the the full name. Water chestnut. Of course, it's a, it's a, a picture taken 
by the scanning electron mic microscope, but you can see how beautifully it is uh, preserved in the sediments. Now, what did we learn from the paleobotany? We could reconstruct the Paolo Hula uh, flora, just as we did with the fauna. We, we focused on the submerged and bank vegetation because that was the habitat where the sites were found. We could see that there were extinct species, uh, but these extinct species are all, there are about 15 of them, are all a uh, part of the um, submerged and the bank vegetation. So they are not uh, typical, let's say, Mediterranean ones. We could see the paleoclimatic implications and we have really a unique archive of the early hominin diet, both aquatic and terrestrial, just as I show you, showed you about the, the fauna. And now just to, to show you the extent of the preservation and also the species, on the left-hand side is the currently growing plant and on the right-hand side is a picture of the remains. And this is the, the wild uh, grape vine, uh, Vitis silvestris. Um, very rare today because of the domestic ants uh, which prevail, but you can see two pictures of the of the pips, and you can see what is a, a how how fantastic is the preservation that comes from a waterlogged uh, site. The next uh, photo is of a uh, kermes oak of uh, some kind of an oak, uh, Quercus, or again on the left hand side you you see and we have many of these. You see the the fruit. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see the, the scanning electron microscope uh, photograph. Uh, and you can see actually that it was in a very good uh, preservation. And now I'm going back into, uh, into the material culture. Excuse me. And uh, I insist that it's not Corona. Okay, now we go into the lithics. Um, on the lithics, you can see on the top the youngest layer and at the bottom the oldest layer. And uh, well, it's not all the layers, the layers which were represented by very minimal uh, artifact counts were not considered you can see the number of artifacts here, not including the small ones, uh, those be below two uh, centimeters. And I just want you to have an impression, this is of course the, the, uh, the x-axis is the percentage of, of the appearance. In blue is the tools, in yellow is the bifaces. Next to them are the percussors, and then you have in green, you have the cores, and then you have the debitas. And the, the most important thing to take home is that uh, in all of the assemblages, uh, the, the debitas is the major category, as, as in every other site which was not underwent any, any particular selection or, or taphonomic uh, issue. But what I want you to look at is also the extent of variation. Indeed, all these elements appear everywhere, but have a look how much the bifaces, which here are over uh, close to 20%, I would say, or a little, a little bit less, 15%, uh, look how little they are represented over here and over here. So all in all, we see uh, the same uh, typology or the same uh, typological uh, features uh, in the assemblages, but we do see a, a highly difference in the quantity 
of uh, each of the categories or in the quantities of the tools. Now, this is uh, over here, this is the middle sector of the Jordan Valley, Lake Kinneret, and here is the Lake Hula, and we are here at Geshob Not Yaakov, and what you see here is a geological map where all the red are volcanics, and all the yellow are um, uh, limestones. Actually, an older, an older lake that existed here uh, during Pliot Pliocene times. And the green are uh, the flint bearing uh, formations, okay? And uh, another point to take home is that there are no, in this sector over here, there are no major rivers that come through into the site. On the other hand, over here, we have a lot, we have four major systems. Well, they're not big in, in, in the scale of uh, Indian or, or other countries, but you know, here we are in a very semi-desertic environment. So, so we have four ancient systems, which are still in existence, but they don't, uh, their water, during uh, most of the year, they are, they are dry, dry rivers. So, and what is this pattern over here? This pattern over here is uh, depicting the daily exploitation territory of two hours. This only to show you that in terms of procurement of raw material, the hominins who lived over here and um, who occupied the southern edge of the lake had access both to basalt from the red ones, to flint from the green ones, and to limestone from uh, these formations. Uh, so in addition to rich floral and faunal assemblages or, or uh, uh, conditions, they also had access to different types of raw materials and they have uh, utilized this very differently. They utilized the basalt differently from the flint and from the limestone. I'm going to give you a short overview, starting from the limestone, a very short overview uh, of the flint, and then I'll go a little bit into more details on the basalt. So limestone. Limestone, they brought limestone into the site um, as pebbles, and all of them were used as, as um, all these uh, manupots when they, they brought in <coughs> were used as hammerstones, as percussors. And we see it uh, times and again, we have two types of percussor. We have a napping percussor, uh, because I think they used uh, these limestone percussors on the basalt, on the flint, and sometimes even on the limestone itself. But they also had some very tough limestones that they used as uh, breaking tools. Uh, in French, it's called the percuteur de concassage. Uh, uh, and remember that they have some large-scale animals um, very, with very big and massive bones, like hippos, like elephants, like uh, some type of a huge uh, uh, bovids um, and all these needed uh, in order to consume the, the, <coughs> um, the marrow, they all needed um, some force, some particular force, heavy force in order to, to penetrate the bone or break the bone. And you can see that the splinters of all these uh, uh, percussors, you can see that they really damage the surface of the, of the, so two different types. And when they broke, you know, when they broke, uh, they, they produced on, on them some other tools. So basically this is the procurement uh, stage, the collection of the raw material, and they collected it for percuture de concassage. They collected it particularly for the percussors of, uh, of uh, napping, and when it split, 
when it's split, they did all kinds of other tools, but they are very minimal in number and, and, um, and form a particularly aspect of the uh, material. Then we go to the flint. The flint are all small in size, they were all located in from say, like the the like the limestone they were all located from secondary sources um, and they were all napped in situ like the the limestone and i just want to show you one aspect of this tiny little core and flake industry you can see here the striking platforms of about 3,000, uh, over 3,000 uh, uh, flakes. And uh, of these flakes, 13%, their, their, um, their platforms, the striking platforms were removed. You can see it, uh, this is a removed striking platform. In other words, they produced the flake and then they, they modified the flake by removing their striking platform. Um, we had several types. We have five types. I'm, I'm showing you here only two types. You have a single tooth, the removal that ended as a single tooth, different uh, um, shows, and a scraper-like very different and uh, this is a uh, very repetitive as you saw from the numbers and our conclusions is that uh, the artifacts were uh, the removed striking platforms are uh, sig significantly more often uh, on retouched uh, tools on retouched flint tools they show ventral removals they are usually on, on flakes which have a radial scar pattern. They are some, sometimes, quite often, distally broken, and they have, at times, double patination. And our conclusion is that the artifacts with removed striking platform are preparation for hafting. I mean, uh, it needed the boldness, to a certain extent, to propose this uh, suggestion because we don't have any information about adhesives, we don't have any information of tools in situ, um, uh, uh, composite tools that shows it, but uh, based on the analysis that uh, my colleague Nina alperson Ophil and I did, this is the conclusion that, the, the, that we uh, reached. So that is, um, uh, in short, uh, two points about the the flint. This is the procurement uh, of the of the flint, and you can see that you can do lots of things. But the most important thing, as we've seen, the goal of the thing is to produce a flake tool. And these flake tools, uh, some of them, as I've shown you, the example above is were made for probably for hafting. But on the way, you have small flint nodules, you have cores, then you have flakes and core waste. You have a, a lots of, of things, and you have a production of flakes. You have a, a larger flint nodules. Sometimes they make bifaces. You have the products of the bifaces. You have the cladetide, the bifas, the typical product of the bifaces. You have a, some kind of levalua course. You have a, many things like levalua flakes. And but the goal, the goal here is the flake tools. Uh, maybe I should go back to the yeah to to the limestone. Uh, in the limestone, the two goals, the, the planned goals, on the way you have accidents, but the planned goals is the percussors over here. And as you can see with the flint, the goal here is to do something totally different are the multiple uh, flake tools that we have. And actually I have to say that the largest number of artifacts at GBY uh, are the flake tools. 
And now we go into something totally different. We go into the basalt. And I pay um, more attention perhaps to the basalt. Exactly in the same manner. Nama, I, I think your uh, volume, you're frozen a bit. Can everyone please switch off their video so that we can increase the speed here? Oops. Nama? The stars depicts the location of a, either Handex or Cleaver. And you can see a close up here on, on the right hand side. Uh, and you can see uh, then there's no orientation. It was not arranged by, by any uh, water action or any other um, agent. And uh, they are uh, still in the primary location. Um, and they are very dense. I think in this uh, layer, the density of bifaces is about um, a 14 point something bifaces to the square meter, which is a very high. Now, this is the way that the Hendex made of basalt looks like. These people were really fantastic in their ability to produce it, uh, uh, to mimic uh, one another, to produce all them in the same manner. And you will see later on that they were really homogeneous in terms of the final uh, product, the way it looks. And uh, the study of biofaces, what we did is we used a lot of experimental archeology span we analyzed the archaeological and sometimes the experimental uh, products uh, with the 3D geometric morphometrics. And we also had a very thorough attribute analysis, which provided both typology on one hand or whatever, not, not really typology for, for the bifaces, but uh, uh, at least um, a very detailed analysis of the technology. And it is, I think, the composition of these three things that allowed us to reach some quite important uh, conclusions, uh, or at least to advance our knowledge of the bifaces uh, uh, stemming from this study. In order to make a, a a biface, either a Hendex or a Cleaver, we need to be able to produce large flakes. And the production of large flakes is, is very important. It's, uh, it's uh, you see, in a single, you have to be an expert actually. I know Achilles is doing it uh, frequently, you will see later, but uh, look at the ease with which he is uh, actually, this is Bob Madsen from Denmark, the ease with which he, his knowledge allows him to produce a flake. On the left hand side, you see that he is walking around with, with a, a percussor, with a hammerstone, which he, its weight is over 30 kilos. And I'm walking around with a percussor, which is about, uh, I would say 500 grams. And that's the, the attitude. I mean, uh, this is the privilege of uh, being a female in the field. The, the men will do the slaving uh, uh, job. Anyhow, this is how we uh, look at the material because one thing was clear from the beginning of the analysis of the bifaces is that uh, most of them, nearly 98 or maybe more percent of them were done on large flakes. 
and the, the understanding of how they were able to retrieve or what were the methods with which they retrieved these large flakes is crucial for the understanding of, of the bifaces. So the archaeology, of, of course, helped us a lot. We were able to find a, a number of giant cores. And from this giant cores, you can see here that from here came a flake. From here came a flake that enabled us to, uh, not us, the hominins, to extract a large enough flake in order to be transformed into a cleaver or a handex. And this is a lump. This is an exhausted core. And this exhausted core, I think it weighs, we published it long ago, it weighs over 16 kilograms. So this came from a, a lump that was actually bigger. And this actually is a, a, a Levalua, from me, it is a Levalua core deep in the uh, early middle Pleistocene. Okay, so what did they, what were the lumps, the initial lumps? The initial lumps came from basalt flows. You see here a basalt flow, uh, flow which is about uh, eight meters and in the uh, place where it is the most dense without any vesicles. Nama, your voice seems to have gone. Uh, Nama? Zaili in, in, um, in Kenya, in Eastern Kenya, from the reef. And you can see a slab like this. We have some slabs, but very small ones, and we have only very small number of large flakes, of large um, cores at the site. So it means that the Ashalians napped their, their large slabs uh, probably on the flows themselves, like they used it as a quarry, and then transported only a very minimal number of uh, slabs like this to the site. They had to fragment them. I'll show in a, in a minute. They had to fragment the, the, the original size of the slab. And from the fragmented piece, they um, modified a core. I want to draw your attention that in this part of the flows, where you have a, a, a big uh, and thick uh, 20 or 30 centimeters thick uh, slabs, you also have very thin ones. And we have these very thin ones also at GBY. They were collected and just remember that there are also thin slabs. I will uh, go back to it uh, in a few moments. Now, the fragmentation has to take place. Uh, these are the, the fragments or the, the, the fragments of the slabs that you can see in the section that they are slabs as they are in GBY. And here you can see a, a fantastic example of the Irian Jaya people of, uh, as, as depicted in the wonderful uh, monograph of Petrecan and Petrecan describing the production of bifacial tools, axes and edges in, in uh, this part of the world. So what happens next? We fragmented the slab and now we have to produce uh, the large flakes. And I'm going to show you um, Dr. Achilles uh, in, in the three a small um, uh, uh, video clips showing us how, uh, what were the different methods with which the Achilleans at GBY produced these large flakes. The cores are flaked by facial, 
one flake scar serves as the striking platform for the next detachment. This process is repeated sequentially. So this is the bifacial type of napping. And as you can see, you can have large flakes. And from these large flakes, you can now work uh, ahead and, and produce the, the cleaver or the handex. The second type. Cores. This technology involves detaching a very large flake from a core. Then the flake was used as a core to detach a predetermined flake. So the Kombewa, perhaps I should show you again because this is quite a sophisticated method of a production of a, a large flakes. Is this? The cores are flaked by oh, facial. The by One facial. flake scar okay. serves as the striking platform for the next detachment. This process is repeated sequentially. And now <clears throat> we will see the Kombewa one and pay attention because you first take off a large flake and then from that large flake you produce another large flake and it will be the target object for the production. Kombewa cores. This technology involves detaching a very large flake from a core. Then the flake was used as a core to detach a predetermined flake. Okay, and now we go for the third one. Slicing technology. Using another technology, cores could be sliced continuously to detach suitable thin flakes. This technique had several variations. Further flakes. Okay. So we have seen three, and we've seen the Levalua core, it's already four, and it seems to me that they had more, but we did not, um, we did not um, record it because we had a very low number of, as I said, of giant cores. But it already gives you a hint or gives you an idea that the sophistication of the Achillean nappers was to such an extent that they were actually capable of maneuvering themselves between different technologies, finding the most suitable or whatever each time the nap, but they all of these coexistent in the same um, in the same horizons, in the same uh, archaeological uh, sites. In other words, the knowledge of producing these bifaces was very, very uh, entrenched and, and uh, you need to have a lot of experience and quite a lot of skill. I mean, these people were skilled in order to produce this kind of um, <coughs> um, large flakes. Uh, now, later on, I, I, in this uh, coming up video, you will see uh, uh, Michel Brenet, a fantastic uh, French napper, uh, producing uh, uh, the first stages of what you do with a large flake. He already holds in his hand a large flake, and then he has to to produce the the um, the final uh, modification to the flake in order to result with um, with a handex or a cleavers. In this case, it will be a handex. Now he's finishing it with an antler precursor. Okay, so we move uh, ahead. Now we 
uh, we so we have the collection. We understand a little bit about the technology, and now we have to understand how to analyze this material, the the final products that we have. Uh, here on the left hand side, you see the three D scan that we've done, and coming up, you see two others. This is uh, the highest resolution of the three D. This is a less uh, high resolution, only uh, uh, 5,000 vertices. And this is a modification of board system. So the old system of board and row and many other people who took uh, measurements in different parts of the artifact. But you can see that, oops, you can see that our, um, that, that our uh, 3D, it provided a, a much better resolution uh, when we, you compare it to the 14 vertices, uh, which is a modification on a board's system. And it allows you to get a, a much higher resolution in terms of uh, understanding of, of, uh, of the assemblage, of the bifacial uh, assemblage. Okay, so now a uh, few, just a few words about what came out of it. We have analyzed with the, with the 3D um, all, the, all the bifaces, uh, both the uh, hendexes and cleavers from the side. And I, I'm not going to bore you with all these uh, things, but I just want to tell you that um, uh, we have a very high morphological homogeneity of the hendexes. You can see the homogeneity in the, the very dark blue colors. And um, the lighter colors show you the, the places of the, of the variability. I mean, each, each of the hendexes here is a, is a mean representation of, of the morphological re representation of each of the layers. So you have here a depiction of eight different layers. And just as the eye shows you, they are pretty homogeneous. Uh, but as we have uh, analyzed uh, with the attribute analysis, and as I tried to show you in the previous um, videos, there is a lot of technological variability. But the final product does not show you too much of this technological variability. And this pattern that you can, uh, that you are able to produce the bifaces with different um, uh, techniques, but at the end uh, have a result which is of high homogeneity, this is a pattern which is characteristic of expert nappers. And that was one of the, of the important uh, results of our study. I could say that none of the expert um, and nappers that, that we introduced to the site were capable to produce such beautiful and well-made hendexes as the original Achilleans. So that tells you something about us and also maybe about them. And when I look, uh, when I show you this uh, flow chart as I've done with the others, this is the procurement of the slabs. And you see thick slabs, giant cores, cores and core tools, flakes and other things. And finally, hendexes and cleavers. Uh, hendexes and cleavers were the prime goal of using these uh, thick slabs. But as I told you, there were also thin slabs. And you can see that the final goal of this was using it as an anvil. We also have percussors and we have also pitted stones, these are, but, but these are not part of the slabs. These are coming directly from other sources. These are the large slabs and these are the thin slabs. And these are, they produced, well, they used these thin slabs as thin anvils, which were very important for, uh, for their economy. So because of different uh, types of analysis, we were uh, based on the inventory of the bifaces, we were capable of um, 
uh, we were capable of uh, showing uh, that um, we deal actually at the site with the group size. First of all, the analysis of the morphological variability of the, of the indexes show the presence of expert NEPRS. And this I've showed you in the previous slide. Expertise is an indication for a large interconnected social group. And I would not go into the background of this, but this is known from uh, social studies and uh, ethnographic studies and other things. Expertise is self evidence in the rich layers, in the rich levels, where we found many, uh, and many, many, as I've shown you in the slide, in the first slide, many uh, bifacial tools. But we also have a, a part of uh, the sequence which don't uh, show us many bifacial tools. Uh, in other words, layers with a very sparse number of, uh, of uh, tools. And uh, but but the uh, fashion in which these bifaces were done is very similar. So the differences in the handexes abundance between levels uh, can be explained by some sort of a model of aggregation and dispersal mechanism. When many people come together. They need a lot of, of a, well, they celebrating something or they're feasting on something. So they have also lots of animals, like I've seen you from Area C um, with my two students and all the depiction of all the animals. But it's also perhaps the same with, with the handexes. Perhaps an aggregation produces a lot of, of uh, these tools because they also need them functionally to do something that they don't do regularly. And at other times they, they use only, the, a group use only a few of these tools. So um, what we concluded that the, at the end is that there is an indication of an extended network which already existed at GBY some 780,000 years ago. And the reduction sequence of the biphases uh, showed us that there are some cognitive uh, abilities that the hominins had. They had advanced planning, they had large scale special thinking, they had cooperate provisioning. You cannot uh, uh, kill an elephant and process it by yourself. They had contingency, they had long term memory. Uh, as evidenced by the the quarrying and and by the, the, the techniques etc and they had expert cognition and uh, am i shanti am i taking too too long no no not at all not at all fascinating please continue okay please carry on i'll try to be short um, I would right. like to go into. Yeah. I, I would like to go into the description of the fire, and um, um, this is based on what we found at GBY. I, I'm not sure I like the way that they, they depicted it, but it's hanging in the Smithsonian Museum now. Uh, the indications for fire come from different things, from burned wood, from charcoal and from burned flint pieces, micro pieces. You can see uh, this comes from the sieve. You can see how the flint uh, is looking after it was burned. We have several articles about it. I would not go into the details. I just wanted to show you a package of layers um, of levels, uh, eight levels over here. And uh, this is the surface of each of them and the red is where you have the highest concentration of fire of fire the micro uh, chips micro artifacts so you see that this this actually superimposed uh, layers uh, you saw the elephant is coming from this one and the many many bifaces you saw is coming from this one so you can see that the the hearts or we call them phantom hearts uh, fireplaces were not in the same uh, location in each of the places. And this is a, a, a map 
that shows you what we drew in the field, like the elephant skull, the log that was under the skull. You can see other logs over here. You can see in white all the 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 manuport. You can see very difficult to see the bifaces. Uh, um, um, you can see the a giant core over here, but you can see the spread of the of the fire and uh, the fired artifacts with concentrations here and there, and interest, interestingly, very close to the skull of the elephant. And here uh, I showed you um, a superimposition of a, a, a burned a flint um, um, over here and a superposition of a, a fish bones, which is mainly fish teeth. So you see that there is an association between the fish teeth and the fire, uh, as you can see here. And over here, this the association between the unburned micro artifacts, but definitely something in the processing or in the refusal treatment of the fish had, was associated with the centers of the fire. And the last uh, um, thing is uh, the Makana. Uh, this is the way that uh, the prickly water lily is looking today. I guess uh, many of you are familiar with this, the Oreale ferox. And this is the way that we found it at the site. I mean, this is a complete one and um, uh, not uh, not um, crashed by by a uh, hominin activities we uh, decided that there was no knowledge in in our area about uh, this plant and uh, speaking with the shanti and achilles i understood that they are still traditionally way of uh, cropping uh, and processing this uh, water lily uh, prickly water lily uh, nuts and so we decided to go to India and to study this and we had a, a very warm for me, very cool for them, fantastic time in Bihar and you can see in this uh, photograph the different stages of, uh, of diving, uh, selecting and, and, and then cleaning uh, the first stage of the and retrieved nuts and then uh, bringing them to the village, uh, sorting them, and then finally um, um, roasting them in, two, uh, in a series of two episodes and then uh, crushing them into uh, pop makana and you can see uh, as you will know uh, here. The point of all this uh, study was to see if there is an analogy to what we have at GBY. We have the fire that you used the makana in order to roast it. We have the pitted stones, and we have also the thin anvils that I was uh, talking uh, to you about it, because you, you are in an environment of mud and you need some uh, strong uh, surface uh, that you can you can uh, bounce the the nuts on top of it. So what you see here is is the another layer we haven't seen before. Uh, they produce some handexes around it because you have the the yellow ones are a clad detail. You have lots of handexes, but you have lots of hammers with with the pitted uh, pits uh, pitted stones next to them and in here you don't have the thin anvils but they're quite a, a lot of thin anvils. This is the main area of the fire so there is really all the ingredients that we've seen in the Bihar analogy of the Makana we saw them here and this is of course our uh, selection um, interpretation, selected interpretation and you can see here uh, a typical uh, Achilles uh, posture, and then we wrote an article that uh, I don't I don't know if if people are aware of it, but anyhow, uh, for us it was very interesting and very important for contributing some essential information to 
the the world of the of the Mediterranean coming from uh, other societies. And so, if I have to summarize two two summaries, is uh, hunting. We don't have information. You see, it's not clear, but we don't have information of hunting. But skinning, disarticulations, and, and everything is there at the site. We have a gathering by diving. We don't have it, but we have all the the the, the drying, the roasting, and the popping, and lots of the popping evidence. Uh, with associated tools we have. Then we have the quarrying and all the way to the modification of the hand axes. And then we have the flint uh, all the way to possibly of the hafting. So the abilities of a single uh, community of Ashalian uh, re repeatedly can, but the uh, uh, ability of these uh, uh, Ashalian communities is fantastic in terms of all these different aspects of life that they were able to carry out. You read in the literature times and again uh, the comparison the Achillean did like this uh, and the chimpanzees are doing like that. No, the comparison is, is, is not valued. It's not uh, valuable because uh, from a cognitive point of view the Achillean could have done many many more things than that. And if I summarize uh, we have an archive, a GBY, of over 20 individual sites, all superimposed one on top of the other. We have the beginning, uh, at the beginning of this cultural package is about one million years, uh, as I showed you from the drillings. The edge of the lake was occupied for over a hundred thousand years. The occupations kept the original layout of the finds, minimal taphonomic disturbance, we have a cultural homogeneity along uh, the cultural sequence, a typotechnological conservatism against variability in the typological frequencies. And this we explained by the size of the group. We have a favored locale, and I think this is a very important uh, uh, conclusion of our study, the availability of sources, raw material, flora, and fauna. We also have high mobility recorded at the site, of which I didn't speak much except the course, but it is uh, evident in many aspects. And um, we have clear uh, affinities with African large flake Achillean record, and we have an advanced hominin cognitive uh, abilities. I thank you all very much for listening to me, coughing and sneezing, etc. Non-corona. Thank you very much.